maybe we'll start with the start of the film. Like, how did you come up with the idea for Vic and Flo? Well, you know, when you you make your first films, you have a feeling of emergency or something. You know, you have really strong stuff to tell, and you're dreaming to make your first or second film. This is my seventh film, and I'm. 40 years old now so it's not the same kind of emergency mm. so it's hard for me to say where the inspiration comes from because it's really blank page after blank page after blank page you just create the best story you can create but to be more specific I wanted to go to evolve or to have a continuation of curling and for me what I like in curling and in general in my characters is people trying to connect, disconnect or reconnect with the, s the idea of a society or, or a community. So that was the case in curling, it's the same here. I, I'm really touched by people who, who think they can live by themselves outside society and not freaks, not marginal people, mm. just, well, Vic and Flo in the film are that type of people and it touches me. Then I never wrote for female characters that much, so I wanted to try that. Then I write more dialogues. Then I'm always interested in the mechanic of storytelling, so I, I wanted to blend genres of cinema in the same film. I wanted to tell my story this way and then switch totally mm. this way and transform an intimate film into a vengeance film, and I didn't know if I was allowed to do that, <laughs> if I was able to do that. So I always say I'm not a very good storyteller, but I know I'm obsessed with storytelling. So mm. I experiment on that and I didn't know if the audience would follow me and everything I was trying. So all these different energies and then Vic and Flo was born and you just look at the film and you're like, where is that coming from? Mm. You know, and, oh, it comes from here. So. <laughs> So it's really a blank page kind of thing. I think it looks like me, and for the first time I hear stuff like, oh, this is a Denis Coté film. Hmm. I think it's the first time I hear that. I heard that for Vestia, and I heard hmm. that now for Vic and Flo, and it's finally, you know, when I made my first films, uh, people were like, oh, he was a film critic, so he wanted to not copy, but he was inspired by his favorite filmmakers. Nowadays, people say it's a Denis Coté film, so I feel good about that. I feel more comfortable, and finally, I have a signature, I guess, I hope, mm. so yeah, that would be the genesis of Vic and Flo. And you've, uh, I'm, I'm going way off my, my course, but uh, you've used different DPs almost for every film. They, like, you rarely stay with the same, so how do, you, how do you, or what do you think is the thing that people are picking up on when they say it's a Denis Coté film? Visually. Well, that DP stuff is, it's been accidental, you know, I've worked with someone, then he was not available for the next one, then the same thing, then it's, it puzzled me because uh, why am I changing for every film, I'm not mm. sure why, but I still need to find my DP, it mm. seems, I have the same sound guy since six, seven films, editors, five films, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just, I'm my own boss, so the collaborators needs to f they need to follow me, you mm. know. And I'm very, very directive. I'm not. I always think the film is mine and mine alone, which is a bad way of thinking. But mm. so I guess I can be surrounded by anybody, and I will find my way, you mm. know. I'm. How did you come across the visual style for Vic and Flo? Because, I mean, you had your negative guide for uh, best year of all the things you weren't going to do. Um, Curling, you've described as a kind of uh, a literary film. And then you have, like, all of the tracking shots in uh, uh, El Vula Chaos. Like, wh how did you come up with the style of Vic and Flo? I guess you just grow older, you know? I started, I was, uh, what I would say, an apostle of the real, you know, everything. I would never change something in the reality around me. I would, uh, if you give me this place to shoot, I would not change anything. That mm. was in 2005, 2006. Then with El Vue Le Chaos, 2007, it became much more st stylized. And I have a love-hate relationship with that film mm. and I was looking for my signature maybe. Then something happened with Carcass. Mm. I decided to 
make a documentary with fixed shots. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if I was able to do that, following a guy, always working, but with fixed shots. So that was a good uh, aesthetical school for me. Then came curling, which has some camera movements, but it's more comfortable for the viewer. It's just like very, very, it's more about the narrative. Then I came back with this sort of tableau with Bestien. So I guess Vic and Flo would be a mixture of Bestien and curling. Mm -hmm. And I think I found my, my balance with Vic and Flo. I really like the, I like nice shots, well done. Not beautiful, but just something that is well done. Mm -hmm. Well, you feel somebody thought about that shot, you know? And I would never use the camera handheld again. I would, I think Vic and Flo, you can find my signature in there. And I think it goes well with the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, it moves, it doesn't move too much. Like the characters, like they're there, they're in transition, mm. it moves but not too fast. And I hope the aesthetic matches the characters. So, mm. you know, it's just something you never, you don't think too much about your style. If you think too much, it shows. Mm. So I try to have less shots as possible, but at the same time, I don't want to impress the viewer by making all this slow, slow <laughs> stuff. Or I had this problem with Albert Cao, it was just too slow, it was too much. Mm. So now, uh, I don't know, you know, the m I get older and I don't think as much as I used to. And I think it's a good thing. Mm. You just follow your ideas, your choices, and you don't think too much and it, it flows better. Like when you're a young filmmaker, you want to impress everyone and mm. you want to, but I don't know. <laughs> There are some nice tracking shots in it, though, as well. And they're like, they seem like there's especially the one in the POV uh, uh, when I think it's Flo is on the, uh, the golf cart. And you mentioned that they're in transit. They're not, like, they do kind of move. Maybe it's not too fast, but they do seem like characters that are kind of moving at all times in some way. I don't want to get too symbolic or metaphorical because I hate that, but one of my symbolic ideas was the uh, carts, the go-carts. It moves, it's very fast, but it goes in circle. Mm. So I really like that idea. Vic is looking for a place to go where there's a lot of movement, but ironically, it moves in circle. <laughs> and if you watch the film, they don't move that much, but every mean of transportation is in the film. Mm. You have helicopters, you have wheelchairs, you have uh, everything is there, a car, truck, uh, uh, cart, golf carts, and uh, so it seems everything is moving, but it's not really moving. And these women, especially Vic, she doesn't want to move. Mm. She just wants to be there, and that's it. Flo wants to move. So I, I like the both energies confronting each other because Vic wants to stay there, stay with Flo in love, and Flo she wants to rediscover the world of men. So when you make a film like that, you need to confront hot and cold you know mm. and people were afraid that victoria would be too misanthrope in the beginning and i'm like no don't worry she's gonna and slowly it gets warmer and you associate with her and then she's rough and then she and even as an actress she looks rough mm. but it's my job to find moments she's more touching and yes she cries and yes she has her soft spots and uh, I really like to make, I think Vic and Flo is a very rough film and my job is to find soft spots. Hmm. So you, you know, it's like blending, like all the genres we blend in the same film. It's the same thing. It's, I always use the same formula. Vic and Flo is this big pizza and there's so many elements on that. You know, there's pineapple and <laughs> there's anchovies and it has to make sense. When the film was over, I was like, whoa, what is that? I was terrified. I think curling is much more controlled, mm. but I know all the parameters in curling. I could make curling tomorrow and the next week and next year. I know that stuff. Vic and Flo is new for me. Mm. It's that violence, that those mood swings, mood shifts. Uh, so I tried new things and it's a big pizza. I don't know if it's holding together, but now it's okay. We have all these festivals and we sold the film to other countries. and awards and stuff so I feel good about it but at first it was uh, I didn't know what that <laughs> thing was it's, it's a thing mm. 
And how much of that is your collaboration with, uh, is it Nicholas Waugh or Roy or uh, your editor where you're, uh, I mean, it's a film that a lot of people have remarked there are characters that kind of come out of nowhere, kind of cuts out the, the ground between A and B. And I don't want to give myself too much credit. Yeah. It's always a teamwork, but I'm very, very, very directive. Mm. If someone doesn't have a strong personality to say, hey, this is wrong, mm. I'm going to eat these people. You know? So my editor is strong, but he doesn't talk much. Mm. So if he doesn't have an opinion at that moment, I take, I take the space. Same with the DP, same with everybody. So the things you're talking about are, well, my choices. Mm. The, the appearing, disappearing kind of thing, I really like that. Mm. I'm totally fed up with functional scenes mm. and transition shots. Can't stand any more those shots of skies or a tree or a landscape just to make sure the story is breathing better. Mm. better. I don't believe in that crap. I think if you're really precise, you can move to one character, to the next character. And people are always filming people saying, uh, okay, I'm gonna go to the store now. And the next shot is the person driving <laughs> to the store. And the second next shot is someone knocking at the door of the store. And I like my people to just be there in the environment. They never arrive or leave. It's not surreal. It's just extremely precise and you, it's true that Flo, she appears in the mm. shot, and Guillaume, he appears in the shot. He's, they're just, they're already there. The audience is not stupid. We know that we're moving in real life, but I think you can try those things in films and it's not a problem. It mm. doesn't make the film more experimental, but I like the fact that you, you saw it. Mm. You know, and, uh, and some of those characters that just appear, they have a power to them. And it's a film where everyone's kind of jockeying for power. like. Uh, within this small community. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that element of the... <coughs> well, the idea of community I really like. Um, it's like, I, maybe I'm a bit like that myself. I don't want to say the film is autobiographical, but sometimes I like the idea that I'm alone on my planet. It's, it's not an ego thing, but over the years people say, oh, you're different, you're a different filmmaker, you're underground, you're this and that. At some point you believe it. Mm. So I like to think I'm a bit alone on my style, my planet, my made seven films in seven years. There's not that many people in Quebec who did the same thing. So you feel not alone, but you feel a little different. So maybe at some point it goes inside my films. And mm. so I like these people like in Curling or even Carcass or Vic and Flo, these people think they can live by themselves alone in the woods outside of society. But society is there. I won't make, a films ab make films about freaks. Society is there, the idea of community is there, and you need to poison their life with people coming from outside. So mm. in the film you have this fat neighbor, you have this kid, you have the, the paralyzed uncle who he has no purpose. He's just there as an obstacle. Mm. So I like people who think they can be kings of the world, but they meet obstacles and it comes from the society around us. And, you know, I think I can be alone and earn a living all my life making my little films, but no, I still need to have a relationship with the community uh, around me. And uh, so I guess that's my, um, I'm kind of obsessed with that idea. My next film is about, again, some guy living, he's very rich, he's very bourgeois, he lives in this big house, he hates society, but he will have to deal with society. I'm, I don't know, I don't know why I'm obsessed <laughs> with that, but. Uh, is that why there's always a, a road? Like the road? There's is always a, a road, road yeah. huh? There's always a road, <laughs> or they like to be in the forest, but at some point you need to get outside the forest, or yeah, the idea of the road, it's always a straight road, there's nothing on the road, <laughs> it's true, but. <laughs> You know, some, we give all these interviews and sometimes we'd like to sit with a psychoanalyst, you know? Yeah. People have been telling me that all oh, your films are different. I would like to disagree, I would like to agree, I don't know. And at some point there's something similar between all those films. I don't know what really. Mm. Cause people are really trying to put them all together. I'm not schizophrenic, I don't have 75 personalities, but I guess I'm only someone who doesn't like to stay s the same place for too long. Mm. Not in life, but more in my cinema. 
I need to put myself in danger. I don't want to work with a net under, you mm -hmm. know? Like when you go see a new Timing Yang film or Darden Brothers film, you know what to expect. It's not a problem, but I would not be a filmmaker like that. I, I really like to put myself in danger and Is that why in your films they tend to shift halfway through, like almost That's it. like on a dime? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I don't have any certitude, but our private lives is in two parts. Carcass is in two parts. Vink and flow shift so totally at some point. I, I, am I bored at some point watching my own crap? You know, maybe or no. I think I want to get uncomfortable at some point. Mm. I want to put myself in danger. I want to put the audience in danger. I okay, okay, this is too comfortable, let's try something else. Mm. So you're totally right, I'm, or I build something and I destroy it. Mm. Like every time I give an interview to the Cahiers du Cinema guys, they're like, I've never seen a filmmaker building something and destroying it the minute after. <laughs> like you put so much effort in building something, why do you always like, you, you take it out from the audience and everything and, why do you do that? Like, it's a, I don't know, it's like a kid, there's a pleasure of building something and then, mm. you know, when you're a kid and you love that. <laughs> Maybe I'm a bit like that, you know? <laughs> I don't know. One new thing with this is that there you have a score like that you commissioned for the first time. Like, uh, you sometimes get associated with the like diegetic music that's used, other times it's like the Mahler and carcasses, but this one's got a score, what was it like? Uh, it's true that I'm. Uh, I try to stay away from music because I always considered music like. Well, I don't want to say a big uh, generality here, but I. Uh, you put music on every sort of image, and it's gonna work. Mm. I'm sorry, it's gonna work. And I think people are using music as uh, when they are uncomfortable or they are insecure about their material. Just throw in music. You're gonna see it's gonna solve a lot of problems. So as long as I'm comfortable with my material, no music, no music. But this time, I knew I wanted something extremely simple. Just uh, boom, boom, boom. Extremely stupid and simple. Like we're turning the pages of a fairy tale book. Oh, we changed the chapter. Boom, boom, boom. Extremely simple. So I'm like, okay, I won't do it myself. Who could do it? Oh, let's try and ask a real musician. Why not? So I asked this girl, Melissa, and she said, uh, okay, so what do you want? I say, Melissa, keep it simple. But musicians, they will always <laughs> give you something more complicated and more complex. And so she came with this kind of sophisticated stuff. And I basically fell in love with what she proposed. Mm. And the music kind of became a character. You watch that film and you're like, what is that music? I don't know, but something's coming. Something's coming. And the music keeps telling you, okay, not much is happening, but just be patient. Something is coming. I like that. It, it, it doesn't go with an emotion. It's just um, a warning. Mm. I don't know if I would do it again. I didn't fall suddenly in love with music in films, but I really like what she did and it's, and I think the music is uh, in Vic and Flo is working as um, it's kind of telling you don't take this all too seriously. At mm. some point you're gonna be scared or laugh or think it's silly or something's gonna happen, but don't take it seriously. The music is telling you not to be too serious. Mm. So I like that energy going on. And, you know. There's a kind of dread, and it, it like speaks to the kind of horror. A weight, or, yeah, yeah, a weight, and there's a sense of menace. That sense of menace, I'm quite proud of it. it, it al it's always coming by itself. I don't know if it's inside my style or something. I'm not, it's not something I'm working too much, too hard on it, but it's coming by itself. People say there's always something when you film the woods or a very ordinary shot is, is full of tension. Mm. I don't know how to explain that to you. You know, I. I film in the countryside because I'm a very urban person. So I go film stuff I don't know about. So of course when you film something you don't know about, it's gonna be filled with something new. You never saw a place like that. So your eyes are like, ooh, like a kid, like how you say in English, émerveillement, like. Mm. Uh, Marvel? 
a sense of marvel yeah, yeah. yeah and you're like whoa so i like my camera to be right there when i have this sense of you know when documentary filmmakers they say oh i lived with that family a full year before before taking out my camera i'm not like that i like to take out my camera the moment i meet this weird guy because mm. I'm, I'm gonna be whoa so that's what happened with carcass mm. it took eight days and bestia with the animals last time i was in a zoo was 20 years ago or 20 more than that <laughs> 30 years ago so uh, i go in a zoo i'm totally shooting right now you know because it's new for me so the film is gaining something that has to do with marvel mm. you know so vic and flow is the same oh i go in the woods last time i've been in the woods was to shoot vic and flow so for me a wood is it's dangerous it's there's a maniac somewhere <laughs> there's a or a lake I don't think I ever caught a fish in my life. <laughs> so if you ask me to shoot a scene with a guy fishing, he, something's gonna happen, you know? It's, it won't be just a little peaceful moment with a fish, you know? Yeah, something's gonna happen. Mm. So I guess I'm able to create that sense of menace, but I don't know where really it comes from. It's just, I'm a kid and I discover things. And yeah. There's Canadian philosophy that's about how Canada is defined by how it's rural and urban are so different and the, the people in them don't usually cross over and it's that's true. also something that's in horror films right like you go to you think that you're a city person you can just go into the, the and woods. maybe that's why we say canadian cinema is so weird we never understood that why mm. everybody around the world say canadian cinema is weird but i think it is and if you if you ask yourself why is something you just said it's we all live in cities, but we know how big it is outside, how scary and how wide that landscape and how dangerous that landscape can be and cold. And so I guess we, we hide in our cities, but we know it's out there somewhere. Mm. That would be Canadian cinema, you know? You would not see that from a, I don't know, a German film or, a, mm. but I don't know, maybe I'm going too far now. But. In your films, the, the crime element's always in the rural as well. That's an interesting element, like the, 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 kind of the crime, like the, the backstory of there being crime, or like in Curling, the, you assume that the bodies were maybe killed because of some type of organized crime or something, but it's happening off the beaten path. You know what, I think now you're going on that, everything I'm hiding to the audience. Yeah, yeah. And some people are saying, oh, it can be annoying, or is it your signature? It's I never know what to say about that because I don't think the films are confusing mm. and I, I'm always a bit worried when I read that the films are experimental, he's hiding stuff to the audience, he likes to make it complicated. But for me the basic informations are there. If you look at Vic and Flo, okay, we don't know what they did to be in jail. Do you need that? Do you need that information? It's they come out of jail. The film is working at the present time. We are dealing with two characters. They were for many years in jail. That's enough information for me to work at present times and go on. Mm. But people are looking for more. They need flashbacks, they need reasons. But I think everything you need to know is minimally in Vic and Flo. It's not a confusing film. And then someone comes from the past to take her revenge. And obviously these two women were at some point they worked together and something went wrong and one wants to take her revenge. I think minimal information is there. Yeah. Why do we need to know like they robbed a bank and then they in and in. So people are really trying to say that I'm being complicated about that. But I think there's gaps, then there's, my narrative is, is elliptical, but I, I kind of reject the, the label of experimental mm. cinema. You know, I still think it's narrative. Okay, there's films out there that are more generous for the viewer, but I like, I like an active viewer. I am an active viewer. I sit there and I want gaps. I want to fill in gaps. I want mystery, I need to have my hands full of mystery and make something out of it and I need to leave the cinema with questions, not answers. Mm. So that's the kind of viewer I am. So 
that's the kind of films I want to propose to people. Mm -hmm. So seven films, most of them festival films, like they want to call it. For some period, I was really sad, like, oh, I can't make any commercial film or why don't people come see my work? And then at some point you get older, people say, oh, this is a Denis Côté film, you have a retrospective here and there around the world, and you make peace with that. Mm. So nowadays I'm really not ashamed to propose a bestiaire or a carcass. And mm. I have my label, I have my style, I'm at peace with it. So. Hmm. And, but you do give, it's interesting, you withhold information, but then you do give hints. So is that like trying to provoke that active viewer? I mean, for, exa for example, in Vic and Flo, you know that whatever she did was a life sentence and that she got out somehow. And, but then again, Guillaume's not like really afraid of her. So then you consider, was it something that she did or maybe she was wrongfully accused? I don't need those, I don't need those subplots, you know, mm -hmm. I, for me everything is very concrete, like she's coming out of jail and there's a parole officer for life, so she killed someone, it's obvious. Mm, yeah. Well in Canada, if you have a parole officer for life, it means you killed someone. And in my head, if she killed someone, she was in jail for at least 15 years and she's not dangerous anymore and that's it. It's not more complicated than that, and people are looking for her. It's crazy how people from the audience, they think we're super geniuses sometimes, and we're hiding like enigmas in our films. And if you do an interview with me, I'm gonna reveal you mm. incredible stuff. But yeah, it's very, very concrete. And some people read curling on some level that I don't I can't even understand and people are over intellectualizing Bestia on in such a way and now Vic and Flo is the film a big long dream <laughs> no it's just what you see is the film it's a <laughs> you know and, but I like the fact that the audience see a lot of magic and mystery in films but usually it's much more it's very concrete it's one two three you know it's I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it has to do with the fairy tale component because like that allows for something to just be very matter of fact but also very kind of enigmatic and For me the film is very concrete. It's yeah. the story of two women coming out of jail. There's a parole officer, one woman comes, she wants to take her revenge, that's it, they die. <laughs> then how do you tell that story? So there's some fairy tale elements. Mm. No, nothing too concrete, but it's floating. Mm. Good guys, bad guys, big bad wolf, kind of. Then I think the last act of the film has something to do with the grotesque. It has a comic book quality or energy to it. You know, these people, you cannot take those people too seriously. The bad guys, just look at Jackie. She's this, she's this tall and then her partner is like a seven foot tall, he's black, who are these people? You know, they have to come out of... But I don't like sci-fi, I don't like fantasy, I like everything to look real. So mm. the, the viewer is always like, whoa, it looks real, but I cannot grip it in a realistic way. It's I like to say that the film is like a, a snake, you know, it goes like this, and if it wants to go this way, it's gonna do it, you know? Comic book, fairy tale, grotesque. I like those words. Mm. People watch Vic and Floyd, they take it very seriously, first degree. Watch carefully. I know that violence is a bit extreme at the end, but look at it. It, it has a comic book kind of edge to it, you know? And I don't think it's a film made by someone who is obsessed with violence or whatever. I was really looking for a happy end for these two women. How could they end up together forever, happy forever. Uh, maybe they could die. I'm like, can I do that? <laughs> okay, they're gonna go through a very difficult process. It's gonna be ultra violent. And then they're gonna be free from society, the rules, they will start, stop fighting. They're gonna be well and in love forever. I was honestly looking for a romantic ending a kitsch happy end for these two women but it's twisted because I'm using that violence before mm. 
but filming that violence or looking at that violence, I don't get any kick out of it. It's, it was not a fetish to film all that violence. So I'm always surprised when people say uh, it's shocking. I'm, I'm totally shocked. Um, I, well, I think it's still a bit funny. I don't want to be mm. cynical or pervert, but I think it's funny. I don't know. <laughs> It's kind of like the dead bodies in curling. I mean, they're they're dead bodies, but they're not. There's a grotesque quality, but they're not. It's not like a negative. There's a kind of comfort that also exists there. What I really, it, it's le curling was less twisted, yeah. of course. For me, these bodies were just a new relationship to the world for that little girl. Yeah. She doesn't know anything about the world. You can offer her a muffin, or you can offer. Uh, uh, baseball or uh, seven dead bodies she's gonna have a new relationship with something new it happens it's seven eight bodies in the snow why not you know it's her new relationship with the world it's a little twisted but it was a uh, somehow cute mm. but I like to find these things and but I mean it when I say I would not do a sci-fi film or a fantasy film or Tim Burton mm. stuff or, or even a normal horror film. I like the hybrid stuff, and, but I like the realism. Mm. It seems real, but it's a bit outside. It's a bit outside. Is Vic and Flo possible in real life? Is curling possible in real life? You know, I like this. <laughs> like the tiger. Yeah. Yeah, could no. That can a girl see can a little girl see a tiger in Canada in winter? No. But that thing had more to do with an apparition than mm. uh, something realistic. But again it was working with the she was looking for a connection with the world. So I was trying different things. She saw a tiger in the snow and she's trying to tell people around her it's not working. Okay. Then, no, she saw some bodies in the snow. Oh, she could keep that for herself. It would be her secret, her new relationship with the world. Hmm. For me, that was poetic and I really like that. But is it possible in real life? That's what I like. <laughs> it seems like enemy lines is a good example of this. I mean, not knowing the again, real. Yeah. Again, the enemy lines was a fake war film with an invisible enemy. It could happen. People preparing to go to a fake war or an imagined war. It's not a film I totally love because it was made very fast. It was proposed very fast, written fast, and shot fast. But I think it's still a film of mine. Like just a little outside reality, so, you know. What do you think about when you consider those first two films as like the realistic kind of pair, especially uh, uh, Drifting States and Our Private Lives? They were more realistic, but you can feel like in Our Private Lives I was slowly looking for something else. Like, our, uh, Drifting States is just pure reality. I wanted to make my social realism film and everything is real, real, real. I was happy with my low budget, cheap camera, handheld, very, very natural style. Uh, some people say it's my easiest film. Some people say it's my best film because it's easy to, you have a good grip on Drifting States. Even if it's mixing documentary and fiction, it's still a real village with a real history, a real character. You know why he's leaving Montreal, you know why he's there, why why this is happening, everything is... I love that film, but I guess I I needed something more abstract for the what was coming afterwards. So Our Private Lives is not my best film, but you can feel I, I was looking for something else. Then something happened with Elvire Le Cao, I was... I was totally wrong, you know, I was lost, like, oh, I have one million dollars to make a film, okay, now it's time to be serious, and I was trying to overthink everything, I was a bit sick, physically sick, I was on medication, oh, I'm gonna do this big black and white, it's gonna be an amazing RT film, I had this amazing director of photography, the film is just, it's not me, it's not bad, it's just not really me. You can feel I'm looking for something and it's going to come afterwards. Mm. 
but the other day I was watching it and on a big screen it could work but it's not good or bad it's just when a film you feel it's not you mm. I think El Rue Caro has merits but it's not me so I don't I don't regret it I never regret any film but it's yeah it's important that you feel you are inside a film mm. if I had to choose uh, Carcass is my favorite film because I can't believe I tried all those things it's everything I was looking for at that time to experiment is in that film I try I tried some stuff I would never try again it was hard to assume that film I had terrible discussions about everything we tried in that film I can still watch it with an audience, try to understand it. I love it. Curling, I think it's comfort zone from A to Z. I can make that film again tomorrow. Best year, I'm totally comfortable with that film. Vic and Flo, I don't know where it's going. Mm. Is it transition? I'm not sure. Maybe it's new. I still to digest it. It's not my favorite film, but I don't know. I'm trying to. It's not your favorite film because you don't know what right currently, or do you think it will? Because I'm up? I'm like this. Yeah. I don't know if it's myself that much, that violence, that everybody talking to me about the lesbian relationship, which is I don't even agree. It's just two person in love, and the gay and lesbian community they want to ask me so much questions, and some people are they don't like the way I'm portraying a lesbian relationship I'm like whoa 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 this is going too far and it's my biggest budget film it was shot with 30 35 people around me I feel more free when I make Bestian, Carcass mm -hmm. and small films like that I feel more free but you need to make those big ones to um, understand more things about yourself and mm -hmm. so I think now I can s I think curling I have no problem with that film. It's totally me. But I'm proud that I'm trying new things with Vic and Flo and I don't know where I'm going after that. So. Mm. Do you consider your career as a trajectory when you make something new? Like how is it going to fit into this puzzle that already exists? I never make calculations, but well, I, don't, I know that I would not wake up tomorrow morning and say, okay, I'm making a, a police film or I'm making a, oh, let's try a comedy. It's not like that, it's not random try to stay myself but I don't do any calculations in terms of budget like mm. a lot of filmmakers will make a film one million dollars and the next one has to be three and the next one has to be five and the next one has to be Hollywood mm. and if they go down it's not a good sign but I'm totally not like that I'm just shooting a film now with zero mm. and some people are like why don't you sit down wait three full years preparing something that will be major you know or but I'm not like that. I see my work as a wall and every film is a new brick. Some bricks are smaller than others and then you wake up and you get invited in other countries for retrospectives at the end of the world and then you, you're like, oh, okay, something happened and I never calculated something. Mm. I like that. You know, I, I meet other filmmaker friends and you can feel they are tormented by their trajectory. If I start being tormented by that, I'm just gonna drive me crazy, you know? I'm, I'm really not afraid to ask you for your little camera and let's try something tomorrow. If it's not good garbage, a lot of filmmakers, they think it's silly. They think it's, you waste your time experimenting little things when you're 40 years old and you can work a little harder, make a film with Brad Pitt and you're gonna succeed, you know? Mm. <coughs> I'm not ambitious. I'm more a workaholic than <coughs> ambitious and I, every time I win an award or I'm satisfied about something I won't sit there and celebrate I'm always actually somebody asked me and I found that formula but I really mean it I make films because I'm always angry at something <laughs> I think it's my <coughs> duty to be unsatisfied about everything always not be unpleasant with the people around me but you need to be always unsatisfied. Some people, they don't like our, their society, so they make militant documentaries and they want to change the world. 
some people are really really angry at their own life so they make autobiography fic films and they they try to solve problems with their fathers or whatever me i'm just generally unsatisfied <laughs> with the state of cinema storytelling sometimes i'm angry because uh, i just saw a bad film with uh, made for 75 million dollars and i'm like oh yeah okay i'm gonna make one with uh, five bucks you know and uh, i'm always making sure i'm angry at something so that's my motor i guess mm. would you do the 75 million dollar film if it came You know, Vic Inflo is made on 2.2 million. It, it, it's really driving me crazy, all these people around me. Because I never did TV, never did a commercial, never shot. That. I've never been in the industry. There's stuff in the industry I don't understand. On Curling, they gave me a third assistant director. I had no clue what <laughs> that person was supposed to do. But I was too proud to ask, and they said, you know, tomorrow you have your third assistant, okay? It's going to help you. I had no clue what that person was supposed to do. N now I learn, but it's just to tell you that I'm not an industry person. And when you make a film like Carcasse and you end up in Cannes, you have the impression you can do anything with any budget and three people, and it's going to be fine. It's about originality. It's not about resources or... So Vic Info was quite hard. There was people around me. Who are you? What's your what's your purpose in the team? What are you doing? What? You're in charge of the vehicles? <laughs> Some guy was in charge of the vehicles. What vehicles? You know, and so you get angry for bad energy and then you take your revenge by shooting bestial and I'm like that. So your 75 million question. I would try it, of mm. course, I would try, but I'm not looking for it. Mm. And I'm not trying to get connection with Hollywood or whatever. It's sometimes it's easy for me to get money from Canada and Quebec. So I stay here. I would like to work in Europe. Now I've been offered to shoot a short film in Portugal. I would definitely try that. But like I said, I'm not ambitious, you know, I'm not maybe it's a problem you know I'm a very good friend of uh, guys like uh, Philippe Falardeau Denis Villeneuve and these guys I can feel it's you know and it's great for them and they are in Hollywood now and but I don't see I'm a bit different I, I'm, uh, I'm not jealous I don't I don't I'm curious to see what I would do if they would propose me a 75 million film <laughs> I would take out the challenge, but I'm not looking for it. So you're still comfortable doing like a short if it comes up? Just you know Robert Morin, mm. Quebec director called Robert Morin, 65 years old. I think he made at least 25 films with Canada Council for the Arts money and Quebec Council for the Arts money. And he made five feature films with one or two million dollars. That's his whole career. I think the guy is perfectly happy. He's not bitter. And my trajectory would probably look like his. And I'm fine with that. It just it depends on your personality. You know, you have one car, you need two. You have two cars, you need three. You need I don't know, I'm fine like that. Thank you. That's it? Yeah. I didn't do any of the questions I had prepared. <laughs>